Good afternoon. This is my first time at Porkfest, and very excited to be here. All sorts of amazing paleo items on the menu. I was very glad to see that. Um, I'll give myself, it sounds like I had a little intro earlier. I'll give myself a little bit of an intro here. My name is John Durant, uh, here to talk about an evolutionary perspective on health and fitness. Um, and my, my quick background is having studied some evolutionary psychology um, in, during my undergraduate career. Uh, at the same time, I was also president of the Harvard Libertarian Society, which sounds really nice, but I, I ran a very laissez-faire administration, which meant I, it's my you know, way of saying that I didn't get anything done. Um, but uh, ba basically, my, my quick story uh, is that after graduating, like a lot, of, a lot of people, you get your first full-time desk job, uh, people's metabolism seems to slow down, you get unhealthy, and then you look potentially for ways and how to be healthy, and our society has mass confusion about what to do. You know, is it low fat? Is it organic? Is it low calorie? Um, you know, when do doctors help? When do they not? Uh, and then all sorts of implications, uh, for, you know, people have different points of view on health, and, and what are the implications for things like Obamacare or policy towards healthcare and society? So, you know, it started with my energy slowing down, and it ended up with trying to figure out, you know, on a personal level how to be healthy, and then from a social level uh, how, to, how to make good decisions. Um, the, the problem, though, is that everybody has different opinions. And, and the, I think there's a reason why food um, and, and ways of eating are so closely associated with religions around the world is that it's, um, in part, a very good way to separate insiders from outsiders, and it becomes part of your cultural and ethnic or religious identity, um, which makes it very difficult, then, to discuss in an objective and rational way what is actually healthy for people. Um, and then to motivate people to actually eat that way or live that way. So one of the, if we set aside human health for, the, for a moment, because it's so controversial and everybody has contradictory opinions, and you start to look at how uh, to keep other species healthy. I, I got to go on this amazing adventure about a year and a half ago to the Cleveland Zoo. I, I heard about some experiments that they were running on uh, the gorillas at the zoo, they have some western lowland gorillas, uh, two bachelors named Bebak and Makolo, and uh, the, the zookeep zookeepers there had switched them from, uh, from the diet that they had been fed, uh, which was a lot of processed uh, um, uh, a pet food uh, bars, fiber bars, essentially, fiber bars from hell, really, um, and they had switched them to a biscuit-free diet, um, to, to, that more closely resembled their, their natural diet in the wild. And all sorts of different health problems went away. They, they each lost uh, about 8 to 15% of their body weight. Um, their, their biomarkers of, of health and disease improved. All sorts of problematic behaviors went away. And as we walked around the zoo and I got a tour of the zoo, it became very obvious that zookeepers take a very simple uh, approach to keeping all these different species healthy. They look at how the species lives in its natural habitat in the wild, they mimic key aspects of that habitat in the zoo, and then they add in modern uh, technology and sort of the best of the science that you have and you try to take the best of both worlds. You, you, you look at how a species evolved um, and what sorts of uh, lifestyle it's adapted to in the wild, and then you combine it with uh, modern technology. And, and the same general approach works for, works for human beings, and it, and it helps to cut through a lot of the clutter and, and controversy for how to think about how to be healthy today and, and taking an evolutionary uh, perspective. Um, you know, if, if, if you had to look at one piece of advice in the health world that is now uncontroversial and that just about everybody agrees on, aside from... Nestle Corporation. It's uh, breastfeeding. 
Um, you know, there's no serious person in the health world that, that now thinks that uh, infant formula is superior to breast milk. Now, there are lots of situations where that's not always feasible, or, um, and, and, and so there are circumstances where um, other priorities uh, may, uh, may take consideration. But everybody agrees with this piece of advice. And what's, you know, breast milk isn't low fat. It's actually very high in fat. It's not low calorie. Uh, it's not necessarily organic, <laughs> depending on what the mother has been eating. It's, it's definitely not vegan. So all these different standards for what a lot of people today think is healthy don't really make sense when you, when you apply them rigorously to the least controversial area of health advice today. And it, it basically boils, this piece of advice basically boils down to eat like a mammal, right? It's not even a, a, a piece of advice that's specific to human beings. It's the same advice that would work for pick a mammal, from whales to, I only know one type of mammal, so that's, that's all I know. I only have one example. Um, <laughs> So what, what happens with so many, it, it, it was only about 50 years ago, and, and even more recently, when you had food engineers, central planners of food, if you will, who really thought that they could replicate uh, human breast milk better than the body, the, process, the, the product of a decentralized process of evolution by natural selection that arrives at a very intelligent outcome, um, it wasn't so long ago that, that food engineers thought that they could just engineer breast milk or infant formula to be superior to breast milk. And they were wrong. I mean, they, and, and they were dramatically wrong. And even today, you, you know, after they've been trying for a century, they can't do it because they learn about all the bacteria that's in there, the antiviral agents, or the, or things that, that are more than just fat, protein, and carbs, um, things like that. So um, it's... It, it's, it really opens your mind when you realize the area where there's least controversy um, fails all the different health standards that, most, that are promoted today, low-fat, vegan, organic, uh, plant-based diet, things like that. Um, so when, when you start to look at the human natural habitat, I'm not going to go too much into detail in any specific um, um, area we can either talk about in that person and I have another talk later today uh, or later this week on food and paleo diet um, but when you look at during the paleolithic what uh, what humans ate um, we ate a lot of different types of foods we were op opportunistic omnivores we we clearly weren't drinking coca-cola ten times a day um, and, and, it's, and it's fairly clear we're not adapted to that, to that type of food. Um, but we were also doing a lot of things different uh, than today. Uh, so to just run through some examples, um, you know, the, the, the USDA and the government really pushes its food pyramid, which has the base of it, uh, healthy whole grains, and, and it should be the, the bulk of most people's diets. Um, this is also the same diet that the USDA farmers use to fatten up uh, cattle as quickly as possible. Um, it's, it's cheap, too. Um, and, and, and so right there, we have an area where the government is uh, promoting, and large corporations are basically promoting a category of food, grains, that did not enter the human diet in substantial quantities until about 10,000 years ago. So even a brief look at evolution over the last few million years, and, and you don't have to be a, um, an, an expert in the topic to realize that, shows that there's a profound disconnect between a lot of the advice that health authorities and the government give and what, is, what our species is probably best adapted to. Now, you can, you can also apply this thinking to all sorts of other areas. Um, whether it's movement or sun exposure or sleep or social interactions and things like that, and, and pretty quickly get a pretty good sense of what's healthy for you. And, you know, it might not, it's going to vary from person to person a little bit, and people have different preferences um, of, and, and what they care about and what they can integrate into their lifestyle on, on an ongoing basis. Um, but take movement, you know, 
clearly humans and other species are not adapted to being set, sitting all the time and never moving. That's pretty obvious, and, and that agrees with the conventional wisdom. Where uh, the, the conventional wisdom really differs from this evolutionary perspective is in a few areas. First, if, if you look at wild humans, um, hunter-gatherers, uh, or, or even other, other primates in the wild, there's, there's not the same regularity and consistency of movement that you see in modern gyms. So people get on a treadmill and they do the exact same motion over and over for an hour and their goal is to burn calories. Well, th nobody in the wild uh, does that and it's a good way to get repetitive stress injuries um, and, and stress fractures. And, and you don't look at any you know, uh, hunter-gatherers and nobody's counting calories. What they're actually trying to do is expend as few calories as possible, not expend as many as possible. Um, so greater variation um, in types of movement, greater variation in intensity level, um, sometimes uh, it getting off the treadmill and uh, doing sprints as if your life actually depended on it um, is very healthy for you. But everyone, including myself, ends up in the gym and y you get so used to doing the same four or five things over and over again and nobody wants to look stupid trying something new um, in, in front of other people that you, you have too much uh, monotony in the type of movement, the intensity level. Um, when, when it comes to other topics like sun, you know, y y again, you, you have different uh, parts of the government that uh, are so scared of sk uh, skin cancer that the sun has basically become an enemy uh, and you should get as little of it as possible um, and again, this evolutionary perspective makes it pretty clear pretty fast that this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, clearly, overexposure to the sun has some serious problems, and you know that because a sunburn hurts. That, that is the body's way of telling you that you've done something stupid. It's a, it's a, it's a signal, it's information from the body to you to change how you're doing things. Um, and then, of course, you can get too little sun and, and, and develop conditions like rickets or osteoporosis or osteomalacia, um, which are associated with low vitamin D levels. So, again, it's an area where pretty quickly, you, you don't need a ton of expertise in the area, pretty quickly you can arrive at an answer for a reasonable approach towards sun exposure that doesn't require a PhD in molecular biology, um, doesn't require you to go to medical school for five, six, seven years, um, and is probably more or less right. Um, so, so the evolutionary perspective is pretty powerful. Now, when you start to view the body, see, the, the conception, the, the sort of modern scientific technical view of the human body has very much been the one of the central planner looking at something that is broken and imperfect and needs, um, needs interventions to be healthy and work properly. So you can see this in um, a lot of times uh, doctors recommending surgery, a pretty, um, a pretty invasive intervention um, where there are lots of unintended consequences. Um, you see this in uh, pill pushing and anybody who has watched one of those uh, videos or one of those ads from uh, the big pharma companies, I mean, that, that is just an advertisement for unintended consequences. Here is one thing that this intervention, taking this pill, is going to do kind of in poorly and ineffectively. And here are 45 things, you know, hair loss, you know, your, your body parts may fall off. Um, you won't be able to get an erection, you know, and 30, you know, 30 other things, uh, side effects and consequences of this one uh, intervention that we don't really understand how it even works. Um, so, again, when, when you shift your perspective from the central planner to, uh, to one where you realize that the human body is the product of a decentralized process that has arrived at a very intelligent outcome, evolution by natural selection, then it completely changes your perspective. So instead of 
uh, thinking that you're a know-it-all and making these dramatic interventions, you can basically look at simple heuristics for how to lead a health, healthy lifestyle that people have basically already discovered through trial and error, amateurish trial and error, and experimentation. Um, and you can get 80% of the way there for what works for you just by looking at how humans lived in the wild for millions of years. Um, now, a couple other examples um, for how the human body is actually profoundly intelligent and we don't even understand how it works. So take something like uh, fevers. The, the, the sort of technocratic view of fevers is that you're sick, you have an infection, and a fever is, an un, is just this, the body's kind of like broken and, uh, and a fever is just unpleasant and something to be dealt with while you are sick. You know, if, you, if you take a, a different perspective, an evolutionary perspective, you realize quickly that lots of different species get fevers when they're infected or sick or wounded. Um, as do humans. It's metabolically very expensive, it's costly, so it's very unlikely that it's there by accident. Um, and it has a function, which is it's part of the body's adaptive response of fighting an infection. Um, and and the, the simple biochemistry, that's a contradiction, um, but the, the biochemistry is basically that when you raise the temperature on things, um, on microorganisms, it catalyzes reactions and it causes them to um, increase their metabolic rate and reproduce more quickly. It causes, and, and if a, um, if, if you cut off the resources to microorganisms, say by losing your appetite or not eating, and then you raise the temperature like a fever, you're basically causing all the microorganisms to reproduce faster even as you're cutting off their supply lines and it causes a lot of them to die out. So you take this perspective and suddenly you realize, okay, fevers are adaptive, and then you start seeing the scienti scientific papers showing that um, w when, when people take medications that, have, that reduce their fever, their illnesses actually last longer. So children who, who take fever-reducing medications called antipyretics uh, for chickenpox, the chickenpox lasts about a day longer. Um, when, when people take uh, fever-reducing medications for uh, the common cold um, or the flu, it also lasts about a day longer. Now, sometimes that's a reasonable trade-off that intelligent people are perfectly comfortable with. If you want to take medications to feel better, to perform in circum certain circumstances, you know, having, having your illness drag on for another day is not really a big deal. So that's fine. Hello? Okay, there we go. Um, so, What's our time here? so the implications can become a little bit more serious, though, if, if you actually are in the hospital with a serious infection or a serious illness, and if we're having an effective fever may actually be a matter of life and death. And, and if if doctors then come in and view a, a, a fever as something uh, that is wrong and maladaptive, when, in, case it's, when in, in reality it's the exact opposite, then it can actually have big consequences. Of course, fevers can also kill people, <laughs> so runaway fevers are dangerous, um, and, and there are times when you want medications to reduce a fever. But when, when you take this evolutionary perspective, again, in very short order, you, you can get a pretty good grasp of whether something is adaptive and useful and, and beneficial and healthy. Um, so so those, those are a few sort of personal implications. Now, now what, what are the implications for policy and how we think about healthcare and society? I mean, I... I know what a lot of people's views are on <laughs> Obamacare in this room, um, but even if you weren't in a room of libertarians, um, it's pretty easy to see pretty quickly how uh, a 
national healthcare system or heavily subsidized um, government corporatist healthcare system can go off the rails and and be awful and terrible um, when you realize that our modern medical system and medical technology is very good at one type of thing and terrible at another. Modern medical technology is very good at acute interventions when people are about to die. And that could be a gunshot wound, it could be a stabbing, it could be a heart attack, it could be keeping elderly folks alive longer for a few more years. Modern medical technology is very good at that. Where it's not very good is with chronic health conditions like type 2 diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's that are complicated multifactorial uh, problems that accrue over a very long period of time and really the only effective way to address them is by individual people making different choices in their own personal lives. Um, the, the problem is that the chronic health conditions are rocket, you know, skyrocketing and they're very expensive to treat and the treatments aren't very effective. And there's, there's lots of evidence on, on how healthcare in this area of treating chronic conditions is extremely, extremely wasteful and ineffective, which is a point that should make sense even if you're talking to a non-libertarian. I mean, if I were given the choice, if, if, if I were given the choice between two things, which is something like Obamacare or an, uh, uh, the NIA, the healthcare system in the UK, um, and a system where the government only uh, subsidized or provided um, some sort of voucher for catastrophic health insurance, and then had a complete free market um, and not the corporatist market that, we, that we've had for so long, but a complete free market um, in healthcare services related to chronic or uh, health conditions or regular health visits, that would be vastly, vastly prefer, well, maybe not preferable, but it would be vastly more effective or less ineffective than a system in which everybody is going to have to pay for everybody else's ineffective treatments for chronic health conditions. I mean, it's just a, it's just a recipe for disaster. And, we, you know, the, the word insurance has been corrupted and perverted. Insurance, um, as it's used in any other industry, means a group of people coming together um, to mitigate risks that could destroy any one person. So if you, if you look at auto insurance, you pay a, a small, regular uh, premium to avoid a massive downside that could potentially bankrupt you. But auto insurance does not, uh, major accidents and lawsuits and things like that, but auto insurance does not cover getting, changing your windshield wipers or filling up your gas tank or any regular and predictable uh, decisions over your car that people make. Uh, whereas insurance as it's currently used in the healthcare world, it covers changing your windshield wipers, getting premium gasoline, getting the latest tires. Um, whereas the, the regular and predictable purchases that um, where you actually want a price mechanism to, to cause people to to look at their budget and on an individual basis decide whether it makes sense for them to pay for. Um, ver so, so really catastrophic healthcare coverage is what we should be talking about when we talk about health insurance. And everything else is really an entitlement. Um, and it, and it, it just doesn't make sense to use the word insurance to describe it. Um, so that, that's that's one area where it can be useful to think about, to take the evolutionary approach and realize that modern technology is very good at um, acute interventions w when there's a big downside versus chronic, ongoing, regular, predictable interventions that are very, very difficult to address with uh, pills and surgery. Um, other, other areas uh, where 
um, where, where there are implications. Uh, when you look at our agricultural subsidies, I mean, not that we need another reason to oppose agricultural subsidies, but we're, we're lowering the price of wheat, corn, and soy, and, and we've given a huge incentive to large corporate food companies to re-engineer foods to, to use wheat, corn, and soy. Um, foods that humans haven't been eating in large quantities or in any quantities in some cases until about 400 generations ago, which is not very long on an evolutionary time scale. Um, though if we were to prioritize which subsidies and tariffs to get rid of first, I would get rid of the subsidies on wheat, corn, and soy before I got rid of the sugar tariffs if we had to choose. Um, because sugar will do a number on you. Um, the other, other areas, let me check my notes here. I had a few other areas to... One of, the, one of the areas where this evolutionary perspective is very useful is when it comes to microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, things like that. These, um, these are areas where... Uh, Evolution happens very quickly and very predictably. So maybe some of you have heard about uh, different uh, strains of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Um, and it's very worrisome because the, the, the discover a lot of our medical system depends on effective antibiotics and they're declining in effectiveness and due to many reasons, um, companies aren't developing new antibiotics as fast as we hope or probably need. Um, and the reason why the evolution of microorganisms is, is very predictable, I mean, you can really see the, see the train wreck coming from a mile away. Um, microorganisms are, uh, have very short generations. Um, and so, in, you know, in a few days, you can have thousands or more generations of, of a microbe, which means that evolution happens very quickly. They adapt very quickly to new circumstances. There are a lot of them. There are, you know, gajillions of them. Uh, you, you, have more, you have more DNA in your body from, from non-human cells, microorganisms, than you do have actually your own cells. Um, you should really think of yourself as a colony, in, in many ways, as more of a colony of bacteria and viruses than, than human cells. It's, a, it's an odd perspective um, on it. So, so evolution happens very predictably, and we know that if, if you overuse uh, a certain antibiotic, then, then that type of bacteria will evolve defenses against it and get around it. So currently, right now, we again have the large agribusinesses that are using tons of antibiotics, not only to try to keep the animals uh, from getting sick and dying in, in factory farms, but also because animals that are given a lot of antibiotics get heavier faster, they get, they get fatter quicker. And so giving them antibiotics is a way to fatten them up uh, with less feed. And it, it's in part because it's destroying their microbiome in their stomach, which makes it harder for them to process the food and the feed that they're eating. So, again, you take this evolutionary perspective, and you can see this train wreck a mile away. I mean, there's going to be a lot of hurt if, if you, you start to get widespread infectious diseases that aren't responding to known antibiotics. Um, the antibiotic resistance is one area that has really forced me to sit down and think about various libertarian principles. Because if there's anything in biology that is a network phenomenon and has a big impact on people's health, it's infectious disease. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of... Because this is... If, if, you, if you have a bunch of... of farmers a thousand miles away that are creating um, strains of bacteria 
that are resistant to all known antibiotics, that's, that's a serious threat to other people. This may be one of the biggest areas where I'm, I'm probably less libertarian than, than other areas. Because um, if, if, if you start to get these strains of bacteria that don't respond to stuff, um, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and f for just about everybody. It, there's actually a lot of interesting research that, and, and if you're interested in, in this, you can buy my book called The Paleo Manifesto, which I'll tell you more about in a sec. Um, there's a lot of interesting research that the emergence of, um, of religions, agricultural religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, um, a key function of these religions was combating infectious disease because nobody understood, nobody could see germs and nobody understood why people were dying all the time living in these early cities with no sewage or understanding of hygiene. And so suddenly you have these gods that come along and say wash your hands and bathe and everybody has to clean before the Sabbath and one of the beneficial um, effects of this is that people start to care about personal hygiene. But because infectious disease is a network phenomenon, you need to have almost everybody in the community go along with it, otherwise the measures are ineffective. If you have a few people that are dropping a rat into the well or who are um, getting tons of tattoos before an era when, uh, when infectious disease and, and was well understood or there were good methods of sterilization, you, you've got recipes for hurting everybody in the community. So I, I, th this is an area that I've sort of struggled with a little bit in, in terms of um, reconciling certain views about biology and political theory. Um, but, but all of these views are ones that are difficult to arrive at um, or take a lot longer to arrive at if you're not taking this evolutionary approach. But you take this long-term evolutionary approach and y you can actually be smarter than most doctors and a lot of researchers in very short order. Do, you, uh, do we have any doctors in the room? Chiropractor? In, in medical school, there's, there's very little talk of evolutionary medicine and how, how this perspective, of, of basically understanding our own species and how it um, evolved to work. Um, and it's really terrible because doctors are basically taught in a, to be central planners, to recommend interventions like pills and surgery rather than thinking about smart ways that individuals can take control over their own lives and their own health and avoid having to, to do those things. So again, that's another perspective. We basically train doctors to be overconfident central planners. Um, let's see, what else? The, an interesting area that a lot of people have asked me about is why, why does paleo or primal or this evolutionary perspective seem to be so common, relatively common among libertarian folks? And I think there are a few th reasons why. One is that it tends, always start by flattering the audience, it tends to be a pretty high IQ crowd. Um, and, and people here are smart. Um, Libertarians also like to optimize things, and so yes, you can, you know, you can lead a perfect, not perfectly, but you can lead a healthy and fulfilling life eating a wide variety of foods, and that's fine. That's wonderful. But if you are interested in optimal health uh, and peak performance, then you're looking for ways to get an advantage and, and, and make, you know, make the engine purr so to speak. And, and, and so I think that attracts a lot of folks. Y you have this appreciation of decentralized orders and spontaneous orders arriving at intelligent outcomes. That is how evolution by natural selection works. It is the, the, the contrast. I mean, there is no greater, 
I, I, I don't know who's in the last talk, but there's no greater con contrast between the, the central planning God and evolution by natural selection, which is the, the, there's no greater contrast between those two concepts um, that I've ever heard of. And if, and if you just look at the amazing engineering problems that have been solved in the natural world, I mean, some, some of these uh, sea turtles have essentially magnetic compasses in their body that allows them to latch on to uh, the magnetic field of the earth so that as they go on transoceanic voyages, they know what direction they're heading. I mean, that's incredible. It's just incredible. Um, you, you just go to any zoo and you, you look at what some of the animals can do and it's really amazing. And nobody engineered that. No central planner engineered it. It came as a result of lots of different organisms uh, that were little experiments. Uh, it came about through trial and error and a lot of failure. A lot of failure too. Um, so that um, that is another reason why I think a lot of libertarians find it attractive. Other, other reasons. Uh, com being comfortable being different and thinking different than everyone else. Because there's definitely a conventional wisdom in society with a lot of pressure from large food corporations, from the government, from your mother, from the doctor. It's, it's just everywhere. I mean, who... who Take just fat. I mean, for the last 50 years, there's just been this religious crusade against fat, as if fat is just this evil, demonic substance. And you almost get visceral reactions from people when, some people, when you talk about food that has fat in it. It's, it's a little creepy and weird. Um, but you, you have to be willing to buck the conventional wisdom to start taking this evolutionary perspective. Um, if you, you also have to be open to ideas about evolution. And, and if you aren't willing to do that, then it clearly makes it difficult to, um, to take this perspective. Uh, the, the other reasons. The, the food movement to date over the last, say, 20, 30 years has been heavily influenced by, by liberals. And a lot, the, the, and, I, and I think that liberals have actually done a lot of things right in emphasizing certain points of um, that industrial food isn't necessarily good for you, that large corporate agribusinesses don't always have your best interests at heart, um, that we can actually, from both a health and ethical perspective, do better than the factory farm system. Where I think they go off the rails is this huge um, ideological emphasis on plant-based diets, veganism, and vegetarianism. If that's a personal choice that you make in your life, um, for ethical or personal health reasons, I applaud that, and I've got no issue with it. Where I do have an issue is when a, a lot of folks turn around and, and use the, a bully pulpit to, um, to tell everybody in society that um, a plant-based diet is the only way to go, or it's the default healthy position. Um, and if you look at a lot of libertarian crowds, you also you also have more, tend to have more men or have a male skew to it. And a lot of men <laughs> like to keep eating meat. Um, a lot of women too, but uh, the, the, the ancient male role is of the hunter, the killer and griller. And, uh, and so I think that uh, paleo and primal, relative to other food, diet, though I hate that word, uh, movements, uh, has, has more men. It's, it's actually pretty even male and female, but most, uh, most people who are following a diet in society um, are, are women, and unfortunately most of these diets have, have hurt their health, which is a shame. Um, so, so I think you, you have a lot of those factors coming into play. Let me see if I, if I missed any, but high IQ, 
um, contrarian disposition, open to evolution, appreciation of decentralized systems, like to eat meat, and, and optimizers. So I, I think when you put all those together, you get a lot of uh, open-minded free thinkers who are who are willing to buck the trend and be pioneers in a new direction and it, it's ha having been in in the paleo primal space it's a very open source community um, where people want to share information share best practices um, and 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 do it in a voluntary and individual way rather than trying to tell everybody that that they have to eat in a particular way um, so, so those are those. Those are the key thoughts. Do you have another? Do you, is there a microphone? We've we've got to uh, speak closely into the microphone for the sound. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm almost embarrassed to a ask this question, but um, you're the ideal person for me to ask this to. Fire away. I have uh, almost an embarrassing conflict with some of the work that Bill Gates is doing uh, regarding the eradication of malaria. And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that type of work that he's doing. What, what, it, what do you find, what's the complication that you see? Well, Just I, so I can address it. Okay, I suppose it has a little bit to do with what you're talking about, which would be the natural order, the natural evolution, the natural selection process that occurs in a place where there may be limited resources or an inability of the, uh, of the land or the government to support its people and whether this is kind of messing with the natural order or, or whether it, it's, it's a good or bad thing. That, that is a good and hard question. The, the thing, here's the thing about evolution by natural selection. It is an amoral process and so many people when they start talking about it they fall on one side or the other. They, they either make the mistake of thinking that just because something is natural or, or is in nature, it's morally desirable. And then there are a lot of people who make the mistake that thinking that just because something is moral, morally desirable, de desirable that's what's, ac what's actually true. And neither, well, one is called the moralistic fa fallacy and one's called the naturalistic fallacy. In, in the case of, um, of Bill Gates's work, um, I, I think the work that he has done has been profoundly beneficial on individual lives, it, just enormously, deeply beneficial to the individual lives that he, that the efforts of the Gates Foundation have saved. Um, and when you start to have, the, the, the big challenge with infectious disease is that if you are if people have short lifespans, it doesn't allow you to have a very long time horizon and think about the future very much. And I think actually one of the big beneficial secondary effects of longer lifespans is that you start to be able to have the luxury, or it's not a luxury anymore, of thinking ahead. Um, and, and when you have more people thinking ahead and making long-term decisions, you tend, in my view, you tend to get a, a, a better and more productive society rather than people being like, okay, well, I'm only going to live until I'm 40. Might as well rob and steal and have a good time while I'm here. Um, the w ways in which well and here's the, here's the flip side. The flip side. The fl we'll come back. The, uh, the flip side is that a lot of interventions don't actually um, have, the, have the consequences that they'd hoped. So there, there was an intervention, I think, in the 70s or 80s, and I forget which in, in which African country, but there was, a, th there was some key uh, food or nutrient deficiency that was causing a lot of um, uh, problematic births. And, and, and problems in infants. And so there's this big program of supplementation, and, but the end result wasn't to have, for women having the same number of children, um, but now the children were healthier. The African women responded by having more children than before, and, and so 
the problems just came back because now they were just having more children. So that's, that's the side where I think people have to be, um, have to be very, uh, have to pay a lot of attention to because just because it's a well-intended intervention to do something that is, is moral and feels moral, you don't always get the most moral outcome. Um, but, you know, the natural world is ruthless. And, and that's, it, it doesn't share our morals. And, and I think it's okay that when we're talking about human beings, we, we don't have to, I don't think nature is a, a, a moral uh, compass. It, it's, it's, it's ruthless. Now, I think nature, if, if you're talking about a market economy and corporations and companies rising and falling, then I actually think a competitive system that looks like nature is actually a pretty good idea because you're not, you're not causing human deaths, you're causing corporate entities to go in and out of existence and that creates a lot of growth and dynamism in the economy. So that's, that's sort of my, my thought on that issue. Um, do, why, why don't we just go to Q&A and if people have any questions on, on topics of health or policy, um, I'm, I'm happy to field them. Oh, over there. We've got about five or ten minutes. You, you, exp you expressed your view um, questioning uh, the standard medical view of cholesterol. Yes. So I was wondering, what would you think of someone who's been taking a cholesterol drug like Lipitor for years to just stop taking it? So here's what I would do. Um, I'd go into your doctor and, and get, get some blood work done so that you have a baseline, and you may already have that. Most doctors are of the opinion that intake of dietary cholesterol will cause your cholesterol levels to rise and have problematic patterns of cholesterol. So the doctor will say, uh, we've got to keep you on this and don't eat a high-fat diet. And then say, okay, well, the current approach isn't working, so I'm going to try this paleo primal thing, and I'm going to come back to you in a month or two, and we're going to do my blood work again. And if things are moving in the right direction, I'm going to keep on doing that. And if they're not, then we can talk about it. But then you actually have to go and take a month or two, stay on the medication because your doctor will freak out if you go off of it, stay on the medication as you change your diet and lifestyle. And as it becomes very clear that your blood work is improving and your health is improving, then you have the conversation, when, when you have the evidence in hand, then you have the conversation with your doctor saying, I want to get off these prescription meds. And, and that's how you do it. And then the doctor can't argue with the results and says, you know what, everything's going in the right direction, that's a good idea. You're welcome. Do you want to? Or either one, we can do both. Um, I've been trying to keep to the paleo diet for a couple of years now, and as time goes on, it seems to attract more and more people, and there seem to be more and more doctors that are espousing this sort of diet. So when do you think we'll reach a sort of critical mass where you get mainstream organizations like the American Heart Association going behind a paleo <laughs> diet instead of yeah. something completely contrary to... That's sort of an idea. I'm not sure the American Heart Association will ever come around to these ideas because their entire credibility as an organization has been founded on certain advice and it is so institutionally difficult for them to change that I'm not sure they will. Um, however, in terms of critical mass for, uh, for a lot of these ideas, I think it's going to be about six months after my book comes out. So that would be about March of 2014. But it's called, it's called the Paleo Manifesto. It comes out on September 17th. I have some note cards around here that I'm going to pass around after. Um, it's available for pre-order on Amazon. Any pre-orders really help because I'm trying to get on the bestseller list. Uh, during and, and all the pre-orders count for my first week of, uh, of sales. So any pre-orders is very appreciated. Any other quick 
I think we have a couple, seven minutes, so other questions? Hi, um, I've been all over the board with my diet. I, I was a vegan for a while and it wrecked my health, and uh, I got close to being paleo for a while, but what do you think of diets like the Weston A. Price Foundation, what they advocate in the GAPS diet that says grains can actually be added back into your diet if you heal your gut? Um, because it kind of seems like the same problem I saw with veganism was, that, oh, it's a one-size-fits-all diet. I see a lot of paleo people making that same kind of claim. Yeah, that is a terrific question. And for a lot of, there are a lot of paths to being healthy and having a healthy diet. And when it comes down to it, you have to experiment with your diet and see what works for you. And there are going to be some foods that you can tolerate that other people can't. And there are going to be some foods that you can't tolerate that other people can what I recommend in terms of paleo or primal is that people try it for a month, see how they feel, see if they're moving in the right direction, and then from then on, you experiment and you add in foods. You know, if there are foods that are important to your culture or that are important to your family or that you make really well, it would be silly to just be like, okay, I'm going to give away all these meaningful things that, I've, that are part of my life just to adhere to an ideology if, if, if the benefits, the health benefits aren't worth it to you. So if, if you enjoy making homemade bread or if you sprout your grains or ferment them or something like that, who am I to tell you like, not to do that? That's absurd. So, but there are some people who, who really are so gluten intolerant or celiacs that they really can't have any. And so that's an area where I can recommend a good starting point for people, but I can't recommend the ending point. Do we have a mic? Hold on one sec. Here, can you just pass these around? You touched a little bit on uh, doctors, and I've heard about some, some th and I've seen a few things that they've done. I, I mean, like, how do they not kill more people than they save, and I've never heard of them save one. I mean, they might, like, help some a little and then, you know, give them a little bit, but, like, trusting doctors, I mean, they, they want to drug our kids and our old people, but consenting adults can't do anything, and then the doctors, are you supposed to trust them? For what? With they're the AMA great. protecting them? They're, they're great for gunshot wounds. A, acute... <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the acute... I would, here's where I fall is on acute things where it literally is an issue of life and death, very good in, in many cases. Other areas, I mean, one, one of the simplest things that costs lives is that doctors still don't wash their hands as much as they should. I mean, they, they should be washing their hands all the time. There are estimates that some up, upwards of about 100,000 people a year die because doctors aren't washing their hands enough. It is so simple. It's free. There's no controversy over the science, and they still don't do it, which is very troubling. Um, so I, I agree with you. I, I, yeah, I, I encourage people to look up um, iatro, iatrogenics. Um, which is this concept of uh, doctors are supposed to take this Hippocrat Hippocratic oath, first do no harm, and in many cases they don't. They recommend interventions that, that actually do quite a bit of harm. But iatrogenics is this idea of, of uh, medical error causing deaths. And when you look at the number, it's like the third biggest cause of death in the country or something like that. Anything else? Two minutes. Um, if there's, there are little packets of cards in there, if you want to take one, did one get passed around? Oh, one's getting passed around. Great, thank you. Perfect. Um, that has info on, on the book. Yeah. So is there a paleo perspective on dentistry? Because I feel like that's something that maybe we do kind of have right. The, the, the conventional wisdom, often the conventional wisdom is right in regards to the worst industrial food. So the conventional wisdom is watch out for sugar, and I completely agree with that. When you, when you look at hunter-gatherer skulls, they actually have remarkably good teeth. They don't have perfect teeth, but they have much better teeth than all the farmers that came later. So the basic advice is avoid sugar and too much carbohydrate. Get enough sun for vitamin D and good bone health. Um, 
but at the same time, if you do, if, like if, if you actually have, ar don't stop brushing your teeth, and if you actually already have a dental problem, I, you know, I, I sometimes read books and, and hear things about natural dentistry, and some of that veers off into an area that I'm not always comfortable with, where your teeth will sort of magically regenerate themselves. If you already have a, <laughs> a cavity or a root canal, that's the point where dentists can cause the pain to stop and, 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 and deal with the issue, but some people disagree with me on that. Okay, thank you guys very much. I'm, you know, I'm around all week. Sons as I write you this letter Of days past and days yet to come And the message of freedom The message of freedom I stand at the edge of the pages of history And lessons unlearned It feels like these pages are remaining unturned But boys, it's no mystery Children, I'm sorry to leave you this world In a state of disaster It was given to me in a similar state but I woke up so late in the game Now spiraling faster